Hi, how are you guys doing? Can I get another woo? Woo! Okay, cool. Um, so hello, the people at the conference, which is you. And I can actually see you guys. I don't know what Ben was talking about, but... Um, yeah, anyway, so actually I was talking to Ben uh, last night at dinner and we were having this conversation and he said, oh, well, I'm speaking in the morning. And I said, oh, well, I'm speaking in the afternoon. You know, what are you going to talk about? Because maybe, you know, like you can say stuff and then I can build upon that and say some other stuff and it'll all like flow together really nicely. And he said, yeah, yeah, sure, great, okay. And so I was like, so what are you talking about? And he said, uh, he said I'm going to tell them that we won. And I said, okay, cool. And he said, what are you going to talk about? And I said, funny hats. <laughs> so I said, okay. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I guess uh, before I jump into anything, it's, I find it better to start with, uh, I've got lots of things to show you up there, but maybe I can show you some things here in physical space first. Um, so if I could ask uh, my two lovely assistants to come to the stage for a second. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you can like, come this way. It'd be good. Um, so, yeah, so I, am, I do many things, as was described before I got up here. Um, I'm an artist, a designer, a technologist. I teach some stuff, um, and I make things. I'm also a maker. Um, you know, all these terms come with a lot of baggage, so, you know, I'm just like a girl who makes funny hats. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, so just to start with, um, this is part of a series of hats I've been working on recently, and they're really dead simple. Um, so they have some really basic design constraints. Um, I'm going to have to ask you to remove your hat. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but uh, basically, they're just made out of this simple pink felt. Um, and they, the one characteristic of them is that they're all malleable in some form. And so basically, when you put them on, can, do you mind? Yeah, sure. yeah, like something like here. Yeah, so they've got these different shapes. And so, so the thing about these hats is that you can, um, you can kind of shape them so they're sculptable. Um, so, you know, you can get these kind of effects. Like, you can get, like, a little bit bashful. Um, <laughs> you can also, uh, you know, oh, maybe if you have, like, really alert hearing, you know, something like that. <laughs> Um, or you can go for a really sort of suave, like, asymmetrical look, um, you know, like that. I don't know, something kind of fashion-y, like, that could, that could get really, you know, we could get a little twirl in there, a little accent. Um, yeah, so anyway, and then just another version, so there's just, there's lots of these hats out there made out of the simple, you know, dimension of pink fabric, armature wire, and nothing else. So this one's more, it's got, like, a bit more dimension to it. Um, and so for you, put this on. Maybe I should wear your hat. <laughs> um, so yeah, with this, it you know this 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 sort of has a whole other thing going on, right? Because <laughs> you know we can get really far away from each other and still have this kind of uh, experience going on. And so uh, you know this this can kind of follow. This can like leave a trail behind, like Hansel and Gretel, <laughs> or it can actually sort of start to enter, you know, leave the personal space and start to go out into social space. So what's fun about these hats is not just wearing them, uh, but also uh, manipulating them. And, and as you can see over here, like, this guy can't see what he's doing, you know, like, like look at that. <laughs> but, uh, but what could happen is, well, first of all, this can kind of go over here, um, you know, and you guys can be friends. Um, <laughs> and uh, what they can start to do is actually start manipulating each other's hats. So, so maybe you can help them out with that, that little do up there. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, they can actually start sort of manipulating and sculpting, you know, what each other is wearing, which is something we don't normally do, but it causes all these kind of interesting social interactions. <laughs> so now they're tangled up in each other's clothing. Um, yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so I am interested in, oh, someone's phone is up here. Cool. Um, <laughs> I'm interested in people. I'm interested in the relationship between people and the world. I'm interested in the relationship between people and technology. And I explore that in a lot of different ways, which you'll see throughout uh, the things that I talk about here. 
Um, and so this, this kind of track in the conference is new technology. Um, but I have to tell you a secret, which is that I don't actually, the technology that I use in my work, and I do use a lot of technology, but none of it's actually that new. Um, but what I bring to the table is new ways of approaching technology and ways to think about how we can have new relationships with technology. Um, and in the sessions that follow, you guys will see you know, really deep dives into to various facets of new and emerging technologies. Um, and then I thought this is, this is, I have like a bit of a cough, so if I you know, kind of disappear under the table coughing for a minute, just kind of introduce yourself to your neighbor. Um, <laughs> but I was drinking this tea this morning, and uh, you know, the little tea tag said, only he who knows the destination knows the way. And it reminded me the danger of talking about the future. Um, and just because, you know, it's like, I don't know what's going to happen, so it's really hard for me to talk about how we're going to get there. Uh, but I'll try anyway. So, so, yeah. So, a lot of the things that I make fall into this ca category of what I call inquisitive devices. So these are devices that ask questions. Uh, these are devices that exist not uh, simply to uh, you know, meet a need, but, but rather to kind of like explore device space and explore like how devices exist in our lives. Um, and some of these are highly technical and some of them are very conceptual. Um, so hopefully you guys can join me on this journey. Um, so like I said, um, I make funny hats. I also make lots of other devices. Um, this is me with a lot of the things that I make. Um, uh, those two I'll explain in a second. This one, in, uh, the ones on the end I'll explain. That one is something called an inflatable heart, um, which is for personal expression. And the, the one second in from the right is a gut listener, um, which is pretty self-explanatory. Um, <laughs> So, uh, I like to use a variety of tool sets. I communicate through everything from radio transceivers to funnels and plastic tubing. Um, and, you know, it, it just for me, it's really about exploring, um, you know, concepts of technology and taking ideas and putting them into physical form. Um, so, you know, what is it like to, to take a physical idea and hand it to somebody else and see what they do with it? Um, this is an example of, of a hat called a muttering hat. Um, and it's basically about the idea of like, what if you could liberate the voices in your head? You know, like what if you could take the sound of your thoughts and just tug them out and like give them to someone else to listen to? Um, you know, wouldn't that be nice to do that in an unmediated way? Uh, similarly, similarly, this one is called uh, the talk to yourself hat. <laughs> and it's actually really helpful. You know, like, just as, <laughs> just, just as, you know, we are storing parts of our brain in our, our cell phones and we're these cyborgs, like, talking out loud is still helpful. So what this does is it enables you to speak out loud but still have a private conversation with yourself. <laughs> so I'm interested in how devices mediate our relationships and how they affect the way we communicate and the way we relate to the world. Uh, this one's called the discommunicator, um, and it's a tool meant for arguments. So, uh, basically, it, what it does is it takes two people in a heated moment and it locks them in eye contact. Um, so they, they have this kind of emotional exchange, but it actually absorbs the words that are being spoken. So you don't hear <laughs> two days later, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, uh, that sort of thing. And then I also think about ways in which we relate to the natural world. Um, so this piece is called the Glacier Embracing Suit. <laughs> Hopefully all of you have one at home. Um, it is made out of a heat reflective material and it serves to mediate the difference in temperature between the human body and glacial ice. Um, so basically it offers people an opportunity to kind of shift their relationship with glaciers um, and to kind of shift their perspective a bit and have a different type of encounter. So yeah, and then there's the plants. <laughs> Um, so I've been working on this project for a long time called Botanicals, um, and I guess I can show you a little video just to give you a sense of what it's about. Hello there! 
Today's plants are abused, neglected, and misunderstood. Modern life and an increasingly technological and automated society leaves little room for our leafy green friend, the plant. Oh, poor little guy. An elite group of scientists have been hard at work conducting experiments to right this wrong and create a better life for our pollen pals. Aha! Here's a bright idea. Quick, everyone, to the lab. Moisture probes inserted in the soil transfer conductivity information via transitorized circuitry to a series of microprocessors which send serial information via gigahertz radio waves to mainframe servers and connect to a global network of bi-directional audio communication units. Now when a plant needs light or water, a ring -a ding ding It gets on the line and makes a telephone call. Hello, this is Cuban Oregano. I am in need of watering. Could you please water me until my soil is quite, quite soft? The new system is botanicals and lets plants call for human help. These friendly flora can't be neglected, but you won't only hear from them when they're glum. Botanicals plants mind their P's and Q's, politely phoning in their thanks whenever caring hands have helped them out. Our lives are getting better. Thanks, scientists. You're making it a botanicals world. Botanicals. The plants have your number. <coughs> uh, so yeah, so my plants make phone calls. Um, and yeah, I mean, this project started out of a place where we were kind of thinking about uh, how to reconnect with nature in various ways. And, you know, the technology that's involved in it isn't, isn't that terribly complicated, but it's really about just a different application of that technology uh, for a different type of, of connection and awareness. Um, so when, you know, we, originally we had this installed in a public space, uh, you know, and it would call a public phone around all these plants. And so someone walking through the space might hear the phone ring and pick it up, and they'd hear something like this. Hi. This is the Ivy. I'm desperately in need of a drink. Do you think you could find it in your heart to maybe water me a little? Thanks. And, uh, you know, this is meant as, as a feedback system, so it would, uh, you know, the plants would give you feedback depending on how you cared for them, so that you could actually learn to, uh, you know, care for them better and eventually potentially not need the system. So if you water them too much, they would let you know, um, be like, hey, back off a little bit, buddy. Um, you know, if they watered you not enough, they'd let you know as well. Or if you watered them just right, they'd say something like this. Ooh, thank you for watering me. That felt like a fresh spring rain. So, uh, so yeah, and we really loved working with the telephone and the voice in this project, but um, you know, there were some challenges with that, and when we came to want to distribute the project to a wider audience and get more people using it, we wanted to simplify it in a way. Um, and so we ended up switching from the phone to Twitter, um, which was great because then we, didn't, we weren't running complicated things on web servers that people would need to, to have running. Um, we could just get them set up with the hardware. Um, but it was interesting because it really opened up uh, all these questions about, you know, like, what does it mean to have a houseplant on Twitter? Um, and the result for me, <laughs> The result for me was that I, my, my pothos plant ended up with like over 3,000 followers. <laughs> so uh, lesson number one is that your plant is more popular than you are. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is really kind of just an exploration to see like what happens when you use these tools in ways that they're not intended and what are the potential applications moving beyond that. Uh, so with this project, it kind of splintered off in a lot of directions. So actually, the project stayed the same, but um, it just showed up in these kind of different venues, which I think brings up interesting questions about where technology lives now. And that's something I'll kind of come to again and again. But, uh, you know, we developed this into a DIY kit so that other people could use it. Um, so, you know, we sell it through this manufacturer, Sparkfun Electronics. Um, so you can, like, buy your own Botanicals kit and get your plants on Twitter. Um, but the other thing that was interesting was it also ended up in the Museum of Modern Art. 
So it's like 99.95 on the internet, Museum of Modern Art Permanent Collection. So um, it's just, it's kind of interesting that gulf between, you know, like, is this art, is it technology, is it design, you know, is it a consumer product? Um, and I think there's a lot of people playing in this space right now. So I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and I do a lot of, aside from making funny hats, I also do a lot of work with different types of technology and developing DIY tools, and I'm very involved in the open source hardware movement. Um, and this is just an example of another type of board that I worked on. And, and this thing, you know, which you guys may not recognize, but it's, it's a breakout board for a radio transceiver intended to help you uh, install a radio transceiver in your clothing. So basically, it's a, it's a gadget that can help your clothing communicate, um, potentially with another piece of clothing, potentially with a computer, potentially with a broader network. Um, and the reason why I like making tools is because it opens up uh, spaces for dialogue. Um, so with, with tools uh, come other projects and come you know, new kind of viewpoints on how technologies can be used in different ways. Um, so yeah, so this was really about how you know clothing can communicate, and you know resulting projects had this really big span. Like some some projects using that board, you know, were very performative. Like uh, this one is a dance costume. Um, this one is an audio controller for for stage performance. Um, on the right is a pair of networked pajamas, um, so that a guy living in New York could uh, have communication with his wife living in Tokyo, um, and their sleep patterns, even though they were offset, could be communicated to each other throughout the day. So just thinking about like, how these tools can lead to different outcomes. Um, so in addition to talking plants and funny hats, I also have a job. Um, <laughs> I'm a professor um, at the Ontario College of Art and Design in Toronto, and so I'm, I'm a bit far from home right now. Um, and I am not from there originally, I'm from the States, and I moved up there about three years ago to start uh, some new programs. And so this was all part of this thing called the Digital Futures Initiative. And so it's really looking at how to connect artists and designers um, you know, with innovation and, and technological development, you know, and what, what role can artists and designers play in that. So uh, we just launched a graduate program last year, and we're launching a, an undergraduate program uh, in a few weeks, actually. And uh, there's been a lot of stuff going on there. So my primary area of teaching is physical computing and wearable electronics. Um, so what's that? <laughs> Does anyone else do wearable electronics out there? Um, so physical computing, who has heard the term physical computing? Okay, who has not heard the term? Okay, um, so this is a book that came out a while ago, um, I think 2004, something like that, um, by these guys, Dan O'Sullivan and Tom Igo, who I actually studied with when I was in grad school. Um, and the they say that physical computing is really about how humans communicate through computers and, and about the relationship between humans and computers and sort of moving towards a more human-centric uh, computing model. So um, the one thing I really like about about this book is this diagram, um, or this, this little illustration here. And this is called uh, How the Computer Sees Us. <laughs> and um, so, <laughs> so what it is, is it's uh, like a, a little finger, you know, so this is thinking about like traditional computers. It's got like a little finger because it's got, you know, kind of like, you know, keyboard and mouse interface. It's got ears because it presents you with audio, um, an eye because it presents you with visuals. And beyond that, like this computer, as it stands right now, doesn't care what else I'm doing. You know, if I start like doing, um, you know, like some crazy dance in front of this, it's not really going to know that. If I start like sobbing, it's not going to know that. Um, it's not really a super sensitive interface, um, and it's not really uh, super concerned with my humanity. <laughs> so, um, you know, what they say in the book is like, okay, we should think about how computers see us and how do we want computers to see us. Um, and so since this book was published, um, a lot's changed, like all these different devices have come out, you know, where we get to like, you know, shake things and stroke things and, um, you know, kind of dance around. Uh, but it's still a, a relevant point to consider. Um, so, yeah, so in terms of what I teach, um, we actually, there's one really common platform that we use, and, and this is 
uh, one of many, but this one's called Arduino. Um, how many people have heard of Arduino? Okay, cool. It comes from here. <coughs> from here. Yeah. Yes, yes, it, yes, it comes from about five countries, <laughs> and this is one of them. Um, yeah, so Arduino is, is a prototyping tool for electronics, and basically what it is is a really stripped-down computer. Um, and it's, uh, you know, got inputs and outputs, and you can, you can decide how it's going to work. And so what I do is I teach art and design students how to work with, with these different types of technologies and how to go up to the internet and how to hook it up to sensors and, and you know, different things like that and, and see what they want to make with it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so they talk about Arduino as being, um, you know, it's, it's a hardware platform, it's also a piece of software, uh, the Arduino guys talk about it as being a community as well that's very accessible. Um, and I like to talk about it as a canvas, um, perhaps because I'm within the art context, but as a canvas for computing. You know, so with this thing, how can we think about how computing can sensibly and elegantly be incorporated into different aspects of our lives? Because when we, when we start back from the beginning and build back up again a bunch of different times, we can see all the different form factors that it can take on. So yeah, what can you happen? What can happen when you start from scratch? And specifically because I work within the wearables context, um, you know, I use a lot of these different e-textile tools um, that incorporate uh, soft conductive materials, so that you can use um, fabrics and threads that can conduct electricity, so that you can make circuits that are more comfortable to wear. Um, so we use these tools, and, and we really think about it within a body-centric context. Um, and my students come out with a bunch of crazy projects, which I'll, I'll show you some of them. Um, this is an example of one. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about. So, so some of them also start from a conceptual place. And, and this project is basically about uh, how do you disappear? Um, and so it's a, a standard white dress shirt that can transform into something that can allow you to disappear in a white room. Um, and so through, <laughs> through these different, you know, little, little wings that are attached, uh, Shannon can actually hide herself in a corner. <laughs> so though this isn't actually a piece of technology, it asks an interesting question of like, you know, how, how do we not be somewhere that we are? Um, and this is another piece by uh, my student Alex. This is a working prototype. Um, but it's this weird kind of exoskeleton thing um, that she was really adamant about making. And I said, Alex, like, why like do you want to make this? And she's like, I, it's like, she's like, I'm really interested in this idea of, of how external technology feels to us um, and how it feels like this add-on, like this exoskeleton, that sort of thing. Um, so she was kind of exploring in that way. Um, this is a project that this guy Mitch was working on, uh, and it actually might be helpful for a context like this, and it's called the Small Talk Destroyer. Um, so it's this tie, and you can actually put the tie in your mouth, and it has a, a loudspeaker um, that, will, that will declare all of the small talk you have to deliver <laughs> um, in a very short amount of time very quickly, uh, so that then you can move on to the next part of the conversation. So. <coughs> and you can get quite aggressive with it. Um, but but maybe, maybe we should uh, bring some into this context and then we'll, uh, you know, move beyond the that's interesting part of the conversation. Um, so some of these students, I, I get students from a lot of different programs. Uh, some are industrial designers or environmental designers. Some are textile students. Some are jewelry makers. So they come in with these really developed skill sets. Um, and then they put them to work. So sometimes we get works that are very uh, aesthetically driven. So this is like machine embroidery combined with LEDs. Um, sometimes they're more about performance. So taking something like a force sensing resistor, incorporating it with felt, and uh, creating you know, a mask that can blush. So uh, Rachel does a lot of work with incorporating electronics with felt, and so she, she does um, this mask can blush. This one is actually capable of blinking. Um, and yeah, just they, they take on, because of the material, um, they take on this whole other type of characteristic uh, that wouldn't be the case if she were using different materials. 
Um, a lot of these things play out in kind of a social context. Um, so Mayan was in uh, my class and you know, we were going around talking about final projects. I said, okay, Mayan, like, what, what's your final project going to be? And she's like, well, I'm pregnant. And we're like, oh. <laughs> and so she wanted to make, uh, you know, she was in Toronto and her family was in Israel and she wanted to make something so that her, her mom and her other relatives could actually feel uh, her child kicking as it developed. Um, so she was creating a remote interface for that. Um, in terms of thinking about new interfaces, uh, this project is called a Kegel organ. Um, and I don't, I don't have the video to show you guys, but uh, for those of you who know what your Kegel muscles are, this is an interface for them. Uh, so basically you can uh, play different tunes. You can play Mary Had a Little Lamb uh, with, with your Kegel organs. Uh, this project is called the Stock Market Lingerie. So Erin Aaron is really obsessed with data feeds and incorporating data feeds into clothing. Um, and so she was reading a study that um, there's, there's uh, a correlation between arousal and uh, stock market variations. Um, <laughs> and so she, she made this piece of lingerie that as you, as you unclip the back of it, uh, it will read off different stock market quotes. Excuse me. This is another piece of hers called uh, the Earthquake Skirt, and um, it's it's constructed out of debris, and it kind of shimmies every time there's an earthquake anywhere in the world. So so it has a different magnitude depending on on how severe the earthquake is. So you know something that's location based, but suddenly becomes ambient. Um, you know when when the data is abstracted. Um, and some of these projects are very kind of. Uh, need-driven. So um, this is a concussion helmet by, by Michael Vaughn and uh, you know, basically intended for hockey players. And this, there's this problem when hockey players get hit in the head, uh, they don't know whether or not to take them out of the game. And so this is you know, a sensor-laden helmet that actually detects you know, how hard someone's been hit on the head and provides an indication as to whether or not they can keep playing. So yeah, so using these really basic electronic tools, uh, these guys make all these different crazy projects. Um, and it's interesting for me to see uh, these, these uh, tools at work in the hands of creative people. Um, and I think this is something that needs to be considered as technology progress progresses and as it develops. Um, and whenever I'm talking about this stuff, you know, I, I work with physical computing, I work with wearable tech, um, and I just, I really like to address some of the reasons uh, why bodies matter. And the answer is pretty simple. Everybody's got one. So uh, I can see, unless there's something I can't see, pretty much all of you guys have bodies in the audience. Um, I don't think anyone doesn't. If anyone doesn't, I guess they can't raise their hands, but... <coughs> anyway, but this is, this is kind of our uh, universal interface for the world. Um, this, is, this is how, this is our primary sensor. Um, and through, through this vessel is where we experience, uh, you know, pretty much everything that we experience. Um, it's also a really fun space to work in because uh, they're kind of intense. Like, uh, bodies are sexy and gross and stimulating. Um, you know, this is, this is uh, you know, a really charged atmosphere to work within. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, in my classes, we always kind of talk about this, this concept of where our bodies end and where the world begins. Uh, so in terms of working on developing technology, uh, there really is uh, this potential for cyborgism because uh, we have this kind of generous sense of you know, our own embodiment. Um, and so this is a diagram from a paper by Francine Gomperle and a couple other people um, from the late 90s about design for wearability. And, <coughs> excuse me, they talk a lot about uh, different, um, you know, like different criteria for designing for wearability. But I just, I love this image because this image talks about uh, the fact that we've got this kind of like layer of space fat on our bodies. Uh, we have this, this area where we're able to take, um, you know, take external objects and make them feel like they're part of ourselves. Like we aren't particularly bothered by our clothing. Uh, we're not particularly bothered by a small backpack if we, you know, wear it right. Um, it starts to feel like part of our body as we move through time and space. Um, so in terms of designing new technology, this is a really potent area to work within because, because you can almost, it becomes really intimate and you can almost become a part of someone. 
So, yeah, I mean, I, I work a lot in the social context. Uh, my lab is called the Social Body Lab, and really, we're really interested in the social implications of wearable tech. Um, and it's a really interesting moment because our clothing is starting to talk. Um, it's starting to share data. Um, and we're starting to have sensors embedded in different things that we wear. <coughs> Excuse me. Currently, it's primarily, um, you know, in these kind of personal logging devices. Um, you know, for, for walking and sleeping and that sort of thing. But it's interesting to think about where this data goes because suddenly, uh, you know, you can be uh, many miles away from someone and, and not even be that close to them and get information about their whereabouts or about, you know, things like their weight, um, you know, and, and get this kind of, uh, you know, relationship with their, with their physicality. So, yeah. Um, I was in Gothenburg the other day uh, visiting some friends, and um, my friend David is, is working on his PhD at the University of Gothenburg, and he's, he's focusing on um, explorations of algorithms that are inherent in textiles. And then uh, my other friend Angela is a fashion designer who works with embedding electronics and clothing. And, and I was talking to Angela over coffee in the morning, and I was like, you know, like, what do you, what do you think, Angela? Like, what is the future of wearable tech? Like, where, where is this all going? And she said, um, she said, you know, it's weird because there's this big difference between what we think we want and what we actually want. And we got into this big conversation about how they were really obsessed with Tron when it first came out. And, and there's this, all these kind of sci-fi ideas about, um, you know, like, what we want to be like in the future. Um, and, and wouldn't it be cool to, to be able to, to be dressed like these characters in the movie and what would that be like? Um, but it was interesting because it brought me back to um, an aspect of Angela's own work, um, which I think is really important in terms of thinking about the future of technology. And that is uh, subtlety. So technology and subtlety don't often go together, um, but I think they should. And, I think this is not something, you know, this is an example of this is a bicycle jacket, which you can't see too well here, but it has, it's a, it's a well-designed fashion piece that um, has lighting incorporated into it, but, um, you know, when the lights aren't on, it's very, it's very subtle. You, you can't see that it's there. Um, so this has to do with just simple lighting, but I think it's a really uh, worthwhile design principle for technology in general. And I think subtlety can go in a lot of different directions, like not just, not just physical design, but also like, you know, what kind of impact this thing has on the world, what kind of resources it uses, um, you know, where does it go when it dies, that sort of thing. Um, and so this, this friend of mine and I uh, actually co-started this uh, event called the Toronto Wearables Meetup, which, um, you know, we had, it's been going for several years now, but it's kind of about looking at, uh, you know, the kind of di different intersecting fields that, that are caught up in wearable technology. And it's pretty fun um, because there's just, you know, I'm just going to skip over some of this, but we, we end up in a room with people from lots of different universities. And, um, you just end up in these conversations between people from very different fields. So like someone who's the CEO of a company that does stock control computing with somebody who handles technical textiles. Um, or something like this where it's uh, an industrial designer who makes uh, cufflinks that glow like uh, the power symbol on your Macintosh. Or, you know, a performance artist who like buries herself in dirt. <laughs> um, but you know, I think I think these intersections are really interesting, and when these people get in the room together, they have really interesting conversations, um, and they have quite uh, relevant views on what the future of technology is. Um, so with that, I kind of asked the question of like, who are the new technologists? Like, are, are you guys the new technologists? I don't know. Um, as, as in the train station the other day, and I was just looking up all the tech magazines, and, and we could spend a whole like 90 minutes uh, deconstructing this. But um, you know, it's interesting. On the Wired, one of the Wireds, I think it was Wired US, uh, they had the uh, "Here Come the DIY Drones" article, um, and uh, I think the subtitle was um, "Why Should the Military Get to Have All the Fun?" <laughs> um, <laughs> It's a good question, but it does bring up this interesting point of, you know, there is this, this whole kind of um, 
DIY and maker revolution and people are making stuff more themselves and and you know a lot of this has has an impact on where technology is going like people are able to lead through making and it's quite interesting and I, I think it is also interesting to look at the artists and the designers um, this is that show that was in the MoMA last year which I think Paolo Antonelli talked about here last year um, you know artists and designers and architects like like they are really coming into the the mainstream of thinking about you know what should technology be? Where should it go? Um, I think one of the biggest keys to, uh, to figuring out the future of technology and new technology is actually uh, getting over technology. Um, it's kind of like when you're trying to date somebody and you get super keen <laughs> and you're just like, you know, you, you're, you're so over eager that you kind of scare them away. Um, <laughs> hi, hi. Um, <laughs> Because the point of technology, like technology for technology's sake, sucks. I'm just going to say that. Um, and, but technology uh, for a particular purpose or application um, and keeping the goal in mind, that's when good things come out. Um, so it's kind of getting over like the, the techno buzz, the techno high, I think is, is one of the main things to, uh, to moving on. Um, and I think approaching, critical, approaching technology with criticality is also, um, you know, really significant in terms of, uh, like, asking good questions. And this doesn't mean not doing things. Like, you can make the things that you think shouldn't be made. Sometimes that's really good. Sometimes that's a really healthy exercise is to, like, make the thing that shouldn't be made and then get rid of it, um, get it out of your system. But, uh, but, you know, just kind of, like, asking lots of questions and sort of challenging the, tech, the authority that technology tends to have. Um, and I think the things that uh, can, can kind of be better considered in, in technological devices are the really like sticky, icky, like weird human things that are harder to talk about, like uh, longing and need and want. Like how, how does a computer understand those things? Um, so yeah, so just a couple takeaways of things that I think about when I'm, I'm designing new tech. Um, one is that we as humans want to touch things. We like, we are physical beings, we like to touch things. Um, this, is, this is just an example. This isn't even the project itself, but this guy Tom Gerhardt made this mud tub, which is basically like a mud interface um, for, for a computer. Um, so you can, it's a gestural interface in a tub of mud. But these people look so happy. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and there's, there's no reason why interfaces need to be cold or slick. They, they can be extremely tactile. This is an example of some, some variable resistors that are felted where you can tug on them or stroke them. Um, you know, like a, a pink pointed sensor. Like that's, that's an amazing interface. Um, so with a lot of the work that we do in my classes, you just end up with these signs on projects like touch me or wear me. Um, it's really about this kind of tactility. Uh, another thing that I'll say is that we want to touch each other. Um, and within wearable tech, there's, there's all these projects that are about remote touch. Um, this is an example from 2006, but it's the hug shirt where you, know, you kind of like hug yourself and it sends a text message um, to the person that you're trying to hug. And it's just, it's not the same thing. But if, if technology can start to crack, these kinds of problems, like, like how do we touch each other, um, that can be uh, you know, a pretty exciting thing because like, this and, and, and skin are like two completely different things. Um, and the last thing I'll say is uh, we do want to be together. And I think understanding that is, is extremely important in terms of thinking about you know, where technology will go from here. Um, there's all these things, you know, it's really easy to, to get one step or two steps or three steps into understanding like why we like being in the same room together. But there's so much beyond that. It's so utterly complex. Um, you know, so at last, after the last talk, uh, this is what this room looks like without you guys. Um, it's a little bit different. And I, and I sat here for a while after you all left um, and it was interesting because it got really quiet. Um, but the thing I didn't think about was it got really cold. So all the body heat left the room and, and the temperature of the room literally changed. Um, and we don't think about those things. We don't think about you know, what it means to be sitting next to someone, you know, a perfect stranger and to feel their warmth, but like what that experience of, of co, being co-located feels like. 
Um, so I think that's where we should aim in terms of the future of technology, is, is creating technological systems that are able to understand stuff like that. Uh, what does it mean to be in a room together? That's all. Thanks. Thank you. That's fantastic. We have some questions. Let's do questions. <coughs> yes. Uh, wow, uh, that was really interesting. And uh, again, like the, the Twitter feed is going like, that's, that's what they're doing on Twitter right now. Um, what? <laughs> very positive, but there are some questions. Okay. Uh, the most important of which is, even though there seem to be a number of people who know about Arduino here, uh, there are also quite a lot of people who say, did she say open source hardware movement? That sounds fantastic, what oh, is yeah. that? Oh yeah. So let's do that one, what is that? Oh, it's a movement. Um, it's also an organization. So it started, oh, like, um, I guess just about three years now, maybe two, uh, there was the Open Source Hardware Summit. I mean, it's been going on much longer than that, but there was, there was the Open Source Hardware Summit in New York City at the New York Hall of Science. And, um, you know, basically a, a group of people got together to talk about, like, okay, the open source software movement has been around for a long time. How do we deal with all these physical things? Um, and so, as a result of that summit, uh, a, a sort of draft was circulated of, of the definition of what is open hardware. And since then, you know, a whole organization and, and criteria and certification has developed around that. So basically, it's about um, you know sharing plans. So like, if you're doing a circuit board, you publish your circuit board files in a certain way and share them, and they can be modified legally in different ways. Um, you know, if you're building you know like a physical object, you might like if it's a 3D printed object, you might publish the STL files or something, but um, it's, it's sharing uh, plans for physical things so that they can be built upon. Okay, as somebody who doesn't really know this, let's see if I get this straight. So it means that we used to have an idea of inventions, like physical inventions, mm -hmm. where innovation was very much tied to patent processes, yes. especially in the United States. So yeah. there was an idea that, that even if you have like a germ of an, of an idea, you need to get patents very fast and, right. and protect and, and your... Protect it. Yeah. Protect it. Yes, and this is the very opposite of that. It's the opposite. And, you know, both, both things have their relevance, but, um, you know, there's something to be said for, uh, we're all really busy. <laughs> and, um, you know, making money isn't the only objective. Um, it's a significant objective, but it's not the only objective. And you can make money with open source hardware, actually, but, um, you know, it's about like, what if instead of starting from, everyone starting from scratch, what if they built off of each other and stood on each other's shoulders and got all that further? Mm -hmm. So then how about, I guess there's an aspect of this would be the democratization of, of well, you're, you also talked about making. So when you say making, I hear the capital M there, what does that mean? Uh, I guess that refers to, I mean, there's this, you know, kind of maker movement. Um, mm -hmm which, you know, is, is not new, but it's kind of like newly branded um, with the advent of, of Make Magazine and, a lot, and, and basically DIY enthusiasm um, of like people wanting to learn how to make things themselves, how to start from scratch. But it's like um, not about knitting and baking, it's about... It can be. It depends on who you talk to. There's a kind of different... Some people think about it just as like making as like hacking with an Arduino. Um, but it, I think generally it has a much broader... So, it, it, you know, it can be knitting. I don't know. Yeah. So when your students come, uh, when you get your students uh, in there, uh, and they come from all of these different disciplines, uh, I'm again trying to imagine if I entered your classroom, I'd be terrified. You say, I'm, I need to build technology, which is meant to be like a really specialized field. And also, yeah. I don't know how to code. And these are meant to be like impenetrable fields. And if you didn't get in you. there when you were 15, like you're, it's too late. Yeah. Is it too late? Not at all. No, no. I mean, I take like, they, they do get scared and... Um, you know, I, I get these like emails from frightened students on the first week of class where they're like, I don't think I could do this. And I'm like, just stay and you know, whatever. Um, but, <laughs> sorry, I'm like losing my words. Um, but they, uh, you know, it's, it's easier than you think. Um, sometimes it's about just changing one's mindset um, because these are really basic tools. These are tools that, you know, kids learn, you know, when they're, you know, eight years old or something like that. Um, they're not that complicated. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of sitting down with an open mind, you know, with either a tutorial 
an instruction set or you know, someone like, like a teacher or workshop leader who uh, can explain to you how it works. But you know, I could sit down with you for you know, an hour and we could get an LED blinking and you could start to understand what a variable is and it's, it's not that tough. Mm -hmm. Should we be teaching this to kids? Yeah. How small? I know there are educators here, that's what I'm asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's do audience questions. I understand that the audience <coughs> questions can go in all kinds of directions from this talk, and that's fine. That's great. Uh, I'd love to. <laughs> Good. Another way of doing this, even so that the internet can hear you as well, is wave your hand and we'll bring you a microphone. We should have two runners and two microphones now. Over here. Hi, I'm Neta Norma from Media Days in Gothenburg. Hi. Uh, do you see uh, an increased interest in the bodily senses and the way we gain knowledge of the world via our bodies? And what will that take us in that case you do that? The, sorry, the bodily sound system? The, the senses. senses. Oh, the sense. way we gain knowledge via um, other things than, uh, than uh, hearing and, and seeing, the other senses in the body. Uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I think it's just something that we're becoming more cognizant of as, as we take on these devices that are meant to um, replace us, in a sense. You know, like when we, when we have a computer that's meant to be a proxy for us. Um, for instance, like, you know, if someone's <coughs> excuse me, uh, watching on the, the live stream and, you know, they want to look over here. Um, but, you know, obviously, like they don't have control over that camera. So you start to just get a sense of like the very simple things that, that being in a place, you know, in, in your first hand experience uh, come with, you know, like all those kind of freebies of being able to look around and, and like hear subtle sounds and, and that sort of thing. Oh my God, I, I just understood what you just said. So like if we'd have a 360 camera mm -hmm. that would record all directions at the same time and yeah. then each viewer would get to decide where to aim there with like vision, right? For instance. Yeah. No, my mom drew the Okay, okay, more. Right here. Yes, microphone. Let's be brisk with the microphone. Brisk. Yes. Yep. Hi, Kate, thanks for that. Uh, I just wanted to start by saying that you can learn physical computing here in Malmö. I thought but David so. Kurayas, who's one of the designers or the designer yeah. of Arduino, is based here at Malmö University. And we would love to create some sort of ongoing exchange between our hackathons at Stapelbaken, at, at Medea, at Malmö University, and your students. That'd be awesome. So that would be really nice. But my question for you, um, having taught embodied interaction myself, mm -hmm. and being aware that you're, you've been doing so much of this for so many years, do you think students' experimentation has taken on a different flavor in recent years? And I'm wondering if you could say whether there's a bit of a sea change in what they're expecting from their bodies and also from their technologies. Interesting. It's a, it's a leading question, but... Um, <laughs> um, do you? Do you? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's been interesting for me. I mean, one thing I'll say is that uh, recently, within the last few years, I started teaching undergrad, which I hadn't done before. I'd always taught graduate studies. And working with younger people for me was really eye-opening um, in terms of their expectation for things to just work um, and, and the lack of patience. Um, but uh, I don't know. What, beyond that, like what, in what recent years? I can repeat back a few times. Just, uh, just, uh, we'll just repeat it back. Okay, so okay, I'm, I'm interested, yeah. Yes, another one? Another last question? Hello? Even? Does it work? Okay, Hi. yeah, uh, my name is Karin Johansson Mix, and I just wanted to add on to Susan's comment because I'm the head of Medea. Medea is a research center for digital media here at Malmö Högskola, Malmö University. And uh, actually, I'm not, I do not actually have a question, but uh, this is a little bit premature. In that case, very briefly. This is very premature, but I just want all of you guys to know that we are actually developing a lab in order to do physical prototyping. We call it the Connectivity Lab, and we're going to try out this model throughout this year. And we really would like to work in cooperation with all of you guys if you have constructive and creative ideas in the realm of physical digital computing. 
Uh, we, of course, going to work with Arduino because uh, David Quartius is, like Susan mentioned, part of our team. But, uh, but basically, we would like to bring the innovation really down into the university and not just work with our research and the, the students, but also work very closely to cooperative partners here in the region. Thank you. Just to mention. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there, unfortunately, ends our time. So, uh, but Kate will be around for a while. Yeah, I'll be here. Yes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Kate Hartman. Thank you.